Can everyone see my uh, slide? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna let everybody in. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, hello and welcome. Greetings of peace to everyone, wherever you are in the globe today. Um, I guess we'll begin with our session right now. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to the Knowledge, Democracy and Social Responsibility in the Higher Education webinar and book launch this morning where, you know, in this part of the world where I'm at uh, in Canada. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining in from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples that is known today as uh, Victoria, British Columbia. And I'm grateful for the privilege of being able to live, uh, study and work here. It is a very common practice in this part of Canada to acknowledge um, the lands that we are on as one of the many ways of moving forward with decolonizing. And it is especially pertinent today on September 30th, as uh, we honor the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, as you may have noticed um, my button with the orange shirt, and you also noticed that Dr. Bud Hall is wearing an orange shirt as well. My name is uh, Suryani Zulkifli, and um, I've been working with the UNESCO co-chair in community-based research and social responsibility in higher education for several years now, very closely with uh, Dr. Bud Hall and Dr. Rajesh Tandon, who are both co-chairs of the UNESCO chair. And I will be your moderator for this session. So today we'll be hearing from the co-chairs and a panel of uh, authors about the new free and open access book called Socially Responsible Higher Education. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes before we continue with a Q&A session and a, closing, um, and a closing session. If you have any questions during the webinar, please uh, feel free to type in the chat. Uh, Christina will read them out loud later and you'll also have the opportunity to ask your questions during the Q&A session later. Okay, without further ado, I'll introduce you to our first speaker, who is uh, one of the co-chairs, Dr. Rajesh Tandon. Rajesh is uh, also the founding director of Society for Participatory Research in Asia, or PRIA, that he founded in 1982. He is the chairperson of the Global Alliance on Community-Engaged Research, and in 2011, he was inducted into the International Adult and Continuing Education Hall of Fame. Rajesh has more than 100 articles, 
a dozen books and numerous training manuals on themes such as uh, democratic governance, civic engagement, civil society, participatory research, and uh, people-centered research. Before I pass the mic to Rajesh, I would like to remind everyone to please mute their mic if they're not speaking actively uh, so that it won't interrupt the presentations. Uh, with that, please welcome Rajesh. Thank you, Suryani, and thank you, colleagues, for joining this very important event of sharing the book launch of a new book that uh, Dr. Bud Hall and I co-edited. I am delighted that we are able to do so in this wonderful Celerus Network Leadership Conference 2021, which is being held in Boston, but mostly in a virtual space. I recall with great pleasure the exciting Veracruz conference in 2017, where it was held physically. And it was at that conference that we got to meet a number of you who have been providing important leadership to this global network and taking the agenda of socially responsible higher education forward. I am going to introduce to you the main focus and the findings of this book. And then we have, as uh, Suryani explained, uh, several authors who will share their part of the contribution to this theme. And then we will have a discussion, John Shortmarsh, and we will have closing comments by my UNESCO co-chair, Dr. Bud Hall. So I'm gonna now share my screen and uh, show you some slides and I hope you can uh, see them. Um, can you see them? Uh, great. Uh, Suryani, you can see them? Yes, but if you can put it on the presentation mode, Rajesh. I thought I had put it and... Uh, to make the slides bigger. I can see the full slide. Let me see if you can find the presentation. I thought I'd put it there. Uh, okay, let me see if my colleague uh, Niharika can do so. Uh, requesting remote control of your screen, approve. Please do the needful. Okay, um, is that better? No, um, so let's try resharing your screen. Um, you're sharing the screen that has, um, you know, your prep slide window so you can see like um, your next slide so just unshare and then reshare the full screen slide okay so can you see it now no you have to just uh, i'm going to unshare your your screen sharing and then reshare it oh reshare okay yeah reshare just uh, reshare the full screen screen not the screen that has um the slides that are coming up okay it's your in your control so um you're gonna have to reshare now How is that? Great, thank you. Can you see Suryani? Yes, very clearly. Thanks, Rajesh. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Socially responsible higher education, especially post-pandemic. What has the pandemic taught us in our different contexts, even though the pandemic has had reasonably uniform impact? Please move the slide. Well, I can't move it for some reason. Andy, can you move the slide? I can't move the slide. Uh, You're gonna wanna um, click back onto your slides. Can you move it? Um, just click on your slide and then you can advance it. Uh, 
Are you able to go back to your PowerPoint application? Yeah, I can. Okay, and then you can hit um, the forward arrow. Yeah, the full screen. Yeah, you just click on the full screen and then forward arrow. Yeah, I got the full screen. Yep, yeah. and you're trying to advance it. Correct? From my my end, like, I am not able to advance it. That's Are you it. clicking on to the the um, PowerPoint application? Yeah. You, you click on it. And are you clicking on the full screen side or the app side? Full screen. Okay, and then you hit the forward arrow and doesn't go forward. Well, actually, I can't see the forward arrow. That's what I'm saying. Oh, no, just on your keyboard, just click the forward arrow. Dr. Raj, you slope in your left. Uh, scroll down to your left. Okay, I think, okay. I think it's like the end of Finally, finally. It moved. Thank you. All right. So socially responsible higher education. One of the first questions that we need to ask is, what new ways of educating for post-pandemic inclusive recovery have to be considered, both in terms of the syllabus and the curriculum, but also the pedagogy. While we have retreated into a virtual mode of learning, does it take us away from community-engaged pedagogy? That is one of the questions about educating for post-pandemic recovery. The second question that comes to mind is that in light of the serious consequences of climate impacts and the pandemic impact combined, how can we prepare next generation of professionals who are sensitive to these challenges? How can we look at some of our traditional theories and concepts which the pandemic up and day. For example, the notion of global or national supply chains were completely disrupted. Is there another economic model for production? Climate mitigation may entail our civil engineers and managers learning new skills in order to design economic enterprises which are sensitive to these challenges. One of the ways we could do that is to become respectful towards diversity of knowledge systems, which have been shown to be the most appropriate form of coping with the pandemic. Local knowledge, local communities, local action is how millions of households continue to cope with the pandemic, even when nobody could reach them either physically or digitally. And I think a big challenge is for higher education to produce locally actionable knowledge, which is linked to achieving SDGs and responding to climate impacts in the post-pandemic era. So this perspective of socially responsible higher education is embedded in this book that we are discussing today. Ah, wonderful. There were multiple case studies, and you will hear several of them today, from which seven key elements of socially responsible higher education can be derived. Recognition of diversities of knowledge systems and epistemologies. In response to the climate effort, we are now witnessing a renewed interest in indigenous knowledge and practices towards natural resources. During the pandemic, taking care of one's own health through locally available indigenous practices, family practices of building immunity gained a lot of visibility. And suddenly those who were believers in modern systems of medicine 
began to pay attention to traditional healthcare approaches. The second principle is that higher education needs to integrate its three missions, teaching, research, and engagement. In many institutions, these functions remain in silos. Some people do teaching, some do research, and some are responsible for engagement. And many a times, engagement activities are not even given credit to the students. And those teachers who support engagement and community responsive engaged research do not get credit in their promotions because the reward system continues to reward publication in peer-reviewed international journals, which you pay to receive your own publication back. The third very important recommendation from the lessons of the book actually got reinforced during the pandemic, which is contextually responsive, locally rooted, place-based, and linguistically plural learning. Even approaching SDGs or climate impacts requires contextual understanding because the impact is not identical, the, each social geography is unique, and therefore our students and researchers need to engage in a contextually responsive manner. And since much of the indigenous knowledge, experiential knowledge, oral knowledge is linked to culture and language, it raises the possibility of becoming linguistically plural than in merely two or three European languages. Socially inclusive is the fourth principle, which seeks diversity among both students and academics. Many places, diversity of students is being described as socially inclusive, but when we talk about socially inclusive diversity, inclusive students, we need to pay attention to the context from where they come, the socioeconomic and cultural background that they represent, and the related identity challenges that they have faced. Without paying attention to them, this will be a superficial activity and not truly embedded in the higher education system. Their knowledge system, their culture, their language will need to be respected, and their tradition will need to be given a place in the teaching and research that higher education does. The concept of universality needs to be replaced with the concept of pluriversality. What it means is that while certain theorems, concepts, principles, and paradigms may seem to be universally applicable, they do not attain meaning unless they are given multiple contextual interpretations. And in providing contextual interpretations, local concepts, local theories, and local perspectives may need to be engaged with in order to develop that pluriversality. Over the last 20 years, higher education institutions have become defined through ranking system. And that ranking system has now started ranking institutions even on achievement of SDGs. But ranking in a global context takes attention away from local response and local societal engagement by higher education institutions. I think improving one's own teaching and research is important, but not necessarily in relation to Harvard or Cambridge because in relation to Harvard and Cambridge, the dice is so loaded that you can never reach there. Last point is very important that we heard from all these case studies that the pu public purpose of higher education needs to be re-articulated and reclaimed. We seem to have positioned higher education as if it is meant to benefit only individuals who participate in it. This morning, I participated in a conversation in an Indian university where it was said that students are clients, they pay for what they need, and therefore higher education should respond to 
the clients. Such a commercial and market related view may benefit individuals, but ultimately may not benefit society at large. And therefore, public scrutiny and public accountability of higher education, in particular its research, which has gained salience during the pandemic, needs to be restored in the eyes of larger publics, not just students and their parents. So I'm going to stop here and tell you that this book is free downloadable, open access. It has a gender and diversity balance across countries, 45 authors, 17 countries. You see the list of names of those countries. And today you will be hearing from three of them in the course of this presentation. This is the link to download and this is available and you can do that as you listen to the presentation from our authors. Thank you very much. Back to you, Suryani. I will stop the sharing platform. Thank you so much, Rajesh, for your wise words. And indeed, it is very important that we keep to our local context as to not lose that uh, richness and of uh, our own identity being lost in trying to get rankings and so on and so forth. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our next uh, speaker. Um, we have Dr. Tom Olaihok. He is uh, one of the co-authors of chapter six, which is saying no to rankings and metrics. Uh, Tom is the editor-in-chief of the directory of open access journals, DOAJ. And his main task is to manage the global DOAJ ambassador program and global outreach activities, including connecting to other open communities such as the Creative Commons Global Network. He is also a member of the programming committee of Force 11, where he teaches at the yearly Force 11 summer school on the topic of how to evaluate scientific quality for journals, articles, and individual scholars. Tom has been living and working in Africa for many years. Please welcome Tom. Thank you. I will share my screen. Let's see. Can you see the screen? Yes, thanks, Tom. Okay. So our chapter that I wrote with uh, several people, especially also the late uh, Florence Piro, who died uh, this year, Unfortunately, she was very ill. She was very driven for open access, open science, and I will mention her uh, several times during this presentation. She was very instrumental in this, uh, in this sense. So saying no to rankings and metrics, I think that rankings are what is especially driving the system, the publishing system that is now there how the knowledge-based economy dominates the world of scientific publication because there is ranking and how we can go to another system using knowledge democracy. Perhaps we can listen uh, for one minute to uh, Florence on the decolonizing the global publishing industry, which is at the root of what we have to do in, in science. I hope this works. Can you hear? So we're going to reshare that. Um, you have to optimize for video to share your audio. Yeah. Can I share my audio? Yeah, you're going to have to stop screen sharing and then. Um... But I can also leave this out. There is a link. So you essentially. Essentially, what she is saying in this conference is that the knowledge that is being transferred is one way. It's going from the north or the west, how you will call it, to the other countries. And even systems where libraries get access to the northern knowledge are not functioning because uh, they are still protected by passwords, etc. So the essential, the essence of the thing is that there is one world and many knowledges, like also Rani said, 
And there is mainly one knowledge that is being looked at, that is being accredited, that is being transferred to all the world and is dominating the world. And we have to acknowledge that there is so many knowledges that can contribute to the, the science that we want to help the world to become better. The system as it is now is a system of center and periphery. The center is the United States, Europe, more or less, and periphery are the, all the other countries that try to accommodate the knowledge system in those countries, try to publish in the, in the journals that are being published in those countries, and using all the criteria for what is knowledge and what is useful knowledge that are from those countries. And I would recommend you to, uh, to really look at this book that Florence also has contributed to. Flo uh, Florence uh, wrote Postcolonial Open Access in the Open Divide, Critical Studies in Open Access. And you can also find uh, afterwards in this link, you can, you can see what it's about. So what, what does the current science system and publishing system result in? There is an inequitable global research system because there is selection and competition in the promotion of Western knowledge. There is ranking by uh, certain uh, companies and there is metrics that is being refined all the time, but it's always about how many articles have you published in certain topics. There is uh, a bias in the languages. There's a lot of English. You can say, you need one language for science, but uh, as it is, you can communicate science to people that need it in their own language. Other people that might be interested in it can translate essential parts when they want. There is essentially a difference between the knowledge economy versus the knowledge democracy. So what is the knowledge economy? It's a system that is driven by business interests, it's always about how much money can you make about with this research, what can it result in? It has to do with protection of possessions. It has to do with competition and selection and exclusivity. And it has resulted in a very few publishers with very many journals dominating the market, publishing mostly Western knowledge assessing the quality by the metrics and the quality control is even in the hands of a few big companies also publishers not only publishers but also a big publisher and it is as if uh, some butcher is just uh, saying this is good meat and the others that come in have to be judged by me so it's not uh, not a real fair system and in fact, the ranking that, the, that these companies do, uh, the Elsevier and uh, the Web of Science, is just more or less serving as a marketing tool for their journals. Because people are convinced you have to publish in these high ranked journals. They are good. We, haven't, we, don't, uh, we think that science is being evaluated in quality by a peer review system that is very good. It isn't. Peer review is very flawed. It's a closed system of a few people always looking at the same thing, sitting in the same circle. And in, in many ways, it's not a very good system. But they always say there is not a better system, which we can discuss. There is a protection of the knowledge, as I said. There is a lot of competition, and it's unhealthy competition because it's not just to publish or perish, it's a publish and perish. You cannot compete with those people because like Rani said, uh, it's impossible to go for publications in nature, all of us, or to be in Harvard, all of us. It's even worse uh, than just this assessment thing. It's also the research topics are controlled by the profit principle. And they are always about controlling, controlling nature, controlling the people, fighting against environment problems, fighting against diseases, 
conquering new territories. That is the way the science is done in the West, and that is being transferred to the rest of the world. It is also not true that all those journals that are being published publish very good science, because the publish and, and perish system gives a lot of unreliable research data. People try to publish as fast as possible, and the moment they have something they want to publish. There is also more plagiarized content, because it's very difficult to find uh, what has been published already. There is an over-reliance on peer review, like I said. There is uh, especially a false sense of supremacy. People from my country, for example, would think that they have a better science than people from Uganda, which is not necessarily true. There is a notion of excellence as a neo-colonial agenda. That is that the people in the North and the West are just acting as if they are better, but also the people in the other countries are believing that they are less, which is also not true. There is a marginalization of non-Western knowledge. It is too simple to say that it's all the guilt of the publishers and the ranking uh, companies, because why are all complying with the system? The scientists, the university councils, the funders, the governments, Everybody is just complying with the system and acting as if they believe that everything is true. These are the best journals you have to publish there. This is the good science and the other one is less. So let's turn to the knowledge democracy. The knowledge democracy is different from the economy because here the human interests prevail and the principles are sharing, collaboration, diversity, inclusiveness. It is, in fact, another science. It is about open access for everyone, open science where everyone can participate, a community controlled mm -hmm. infrastructure, and research that is relevant to society. So the research is judged by the relevance to society and not by the number of citations received in other journals or in the same journal. It's more important what you publish than where you publish. That is a principle. It has been described by Florence as well in Possible, which says there is another science and these are the principles of this other science, people oriented. And the topics in this knowledge democracy based science are working with nature, helping people, protect the environment and focus on prevention in medicine and not on just mending and repairing things, respecting new territories and sharing also the wealth of the earth instead of taking it and trying to get hold of it and keep it and protect it. Thank you very much. This was my presentation. I hope there are quite a few questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tom. I just like to uh, remind all of you that if you have any questions, feel free to type it out in chat and uh, Christina will read it out later. But thank you again, Tom, for sharing your critical thoughts. Uh, your presentation has brought up important questions of who owns knowledge who get, keeps knowledge and why. I think in this uh, time and era, it's uh, very important that we move towards open access so that knowledge can be shared uh, with uh, others without the gatekeeping. Um, we unfortunately are unable to locate our uh, next speaker who's also uh, an author of another chapter. So I guess at this point we'll have to move to our this lesson uh, for this session. I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. John Saltmarch, who is a professor of higher education in the Department of Leadership in Education in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He publishes widely on community engaged research, learning, um, teaching, and organizational change in higher education. 
John is also a member of the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching and a Ludington Center Visiting Scholar at Albion College. Please welcome John. Thanks, sir, and I appreciate it. Um, so let me just make a few comments here. And I, um, and I also just want to uh, thank Bud and Tom for, for their comments and presentations and Rajesh. Um, so I want to say first that in looking at this book, uh, which I um, am really moved by, that I'm humbled by the wealth of knowledge in this book. Um, and personally moved by the concept of knowledge democracy, which I feel like I've been reading for some time, uh, particularly through Bud and Rajesh's work, uh, but it feels like it gets richer and deeper every time I read it. Um, so three observations. The, the first one is that um, coming from the global north, um, I really appreciate what I see as a global South orientation to understanding the social responsibility of higher education. Um, and it, it is from that global South perspective that we have a focus on a justice orientation to knowledge that I would argue the global North largely resists. And from a US perspective, we have a great deal to learn about the engagement of universities and their social responsibility from the global South. Um, and institutionalizing a justice-oriented approach, I would argue, is more important now than ever. Hence the importance of this book. It's, it's an opportune time for all of us to, to dig into it. Another observation I want to make is the importance of the epistemic orientation of the book. And uh, Rajesh talk, talked about that, Tom talked about it. Um, I just want to kind of emphasize it here. And for me, it goes back to that higher education institutions have as their core function, the generation dissemination of knowledge. So how we think about knowledge is central to the way that we organize our institutions. And the questions of what is knowledge, how is knowledge constructed, who has knowledge, whose knowledge is excluded, what is considered legitimate knowledge in the, the academy? These questions go to the heart of knowledge democracy, which again, I find is a powerful concept um, that runs throughout this book. And then just a last observation is that also central to the arguments in the book for the social responsibility of higher education is the recognition as the philosopher Miranda Fricker notes that epistemology has both an intellectual as well as an ethical dimension. And I thank my colleague, Dar uh, Darren Lorton uh, from the Global South for introducing me to Fricker's work. Uh, it's in that ethical dimension of epistemology that we can acknowledge and understand the relationship of knowledge to power and privilege, identity and implication, and maybe most importantly to politics. And with this understanding, uh, we come to see the work of the university as justice work and as political work. Universities are spaces of politics. If anything, that gets reinforced throughout this book. Education is a political space. Research is a political space. And I'm saying this too, to make it clear, this is different from political partisanship. But it does ask that all of us become, in Eric Hartman's framing, partisans for democracy. The book asks us individually and collectively to act as partisans for a socially responsible and democratic higher education. And I would also argue that this has to be the future of higher education. So this book helps point us to that future. Um, I want to thank all the contributors to the book, and I can only hope that it's widely read and widely put into practice. I'll turn it back to, I think, Bud. Thank you. Thanks, John, um, for sharing your insights. Um, now I guess it's time for some Q&A. I'm not sure if there are any questions in the chat. I haven't been monitoring, but 
perhaps uh, my colleague Christina can help me out there. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to use the hand icon um, and we'll call upon you to ask your questions or you can also type your questions out in the chat and uh, Christina will read it out loud. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's session. Um, we had an earlier question from uh, Leslie Van Roy, who said, perhaps our speakers can say something more about the apparent opposition between local relevance slash impact and global rankings. Uh, let me let me take this one uh, quickly, Tom. Before you uh, bring, yeah. Uh, what what I, I I see what is happening is that because we are pushing, you know, our higher education institutions to participate in various global rankings. Even within our countries, there is a, 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 an inequality in resources, in recognition, in privilege, in higher education institutions. You know, independent colleges and versus established universities and technology institutions, etc. So, by pushing everybody to ranking globally, you know, last ten years, many Indian higher education institutions have been encouraged or forced to participate in that ranking. There are only three of them who come. They are our Indian version of Harvard and uh, Cambridge. Uh, IIT, Delhi or Kharagpur, one of the IITs, the five privileged ones set up in 1960. I benefited by studying in one of them. Or Indian Institute of Science set up 75 years ago, with lots of money in Bengaluru. That's it. So a small university set up in a region where indigenous populations live and is trying to use local theories, local students in the social inclusion. It is pointless to compete. They, they will never make it in the category. But because you push them, you divert their attention away from what is locally relevant and prioritized and take them into preparing to compete in an uh, unwinnable race. It's a pointless race. So, so it is not that their knowledge that students don't have global relevance, but we have to review our approach to global as multiple locals, not as a singular global. And when you look at it as multiple locals, then the contextual and variety becomes relevant as opposed to uniformity and universality. Tom may have other uh, explanations as well. Let me stop here. So I can I can just um, name an example, uh, and that goes on the topics of research. So, for example, in Africa, I know there are people from Africa here. There is research being done, uh, let's say, in Uganda at the medical faculty uh, for obesitas, obesity. And it, it's not a very relevant uh, topic for that country, but it's very relevant for the United States. And that's where they want to publish their research. So there is a discrepancy between the topics that you just study because you can publish in a country where that topic is important and the topic that you have to study for your own country because it's important in your country. And there has to be more assessment and more accreditation for those topics that are relevant to the, uh, the local situations. That is also the case for agricultural studies, for example, in, in Kenya. Uh, you can focus on very high-tech genetic uh, methods, or you can focus on local knowledge. There is a lot of local knowledge that is going to disappear because people just turn to the high-tech. And the local knowledge can solve many problems for many people in those countries. I think that those are examples uh, of uh, 
yeah, that, that, that you really have to be aware of what you do in a, in a in scientific institute and why you do it. You shouldn't do it because of rankings and metrics and uh, being high in the list or so. And I just might add to that too, that um, the discounting of local is often um, a direct result of the prestige culture of universities. And that prestige culture, um, driven by the kind of neoliberal logics that Rajesh was talking about, is very much tied to research funding. Right? And because that's the, that's the dollars and funding that create the sense of prestige. Um, and so as that funding doesn't focus on local issues, um, and I would also, I always think about this too, it's not just the research, but it's the researchers, the scholars. So it's not only marginalizing certain kinds of research, but it's marginalizing certain scholars as well. Um, and so that prestige culture works heavily against this attention to the local. Um, and certainly in the US context, context that's a significant factor. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I see we have another question in the chat, which closely relates to um, what you've just said, um, John, Tom, and Rajesh. But um, the question is, how best can developing countries engage with research relevant to their societies, seeing as most research grants dictate or rather encourage adaptation of more Western approaches? Rajesh, that's for you. <laughs> uh, I, I missed your first part, Christina. Say again, but I'm trying to read the question in the box. Oh, sure. So the question is, how can developing countries okay. engage with research, um, seeing as most research grants uh, encourage adaptation of more Western approaches? Well, this is a, this is a choice. And each choice has a consequence. We all make choices. We have to make an academic choice. We have to make a choice at, at the level of an individual researcher and then mobilize our colleagues in terms of being accountable to the societies we are part of. So in order to frame locally relevant research questions, we need to develop those partnerships outside the boundary walls of the university system, because those boundary walls have kept us uh, privileged and almost cut off from the everyday reality. I, I know examples where academics drive through an informal urban settlement and go into the campus and give a lecture on urbanization without reference to the reality that is outside the boundary wall. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a question, it's not going to be done through research funding. It's not going to happen, as John has made it very clear, it's not going to happen because some altruistic uh, shift will happen somewhere. This is a question of power. Knowledge, epistemology, as we have been saying, is, is, is positioning of power. And much of colonial occupation in our societies happened on the back of devaluing local knowledge, local perspectives, local theories, local technology, in order to make us look like we are stupid and incompetent and awaiting European knowledge and European expertise. The, the history of colonialism is that history. And now the neoliberalism, neocolonialism is doing the same thing. Is Research frameworks are made in keeping with the agenda of those countries where research funding is available. Our universities are starved of research funding. 
So our individual researchers make the choice, let me participate in this research. So what if it is not relevant to my society? But public accountability questions are being raised. And post pandemic, I also feel just like John was saying that in a decade from now, either we will become locally relevant higher education or we will disappear. We will disappear because the qualifications are now can be purchased through attending digital platforms without even entering a physical campus. And that trend is going to drive away those who are seeking prestige through qualifications as opposed to becoming equipped to contribute towards societal improvement and addressing the challenges of the climate and post-pandemic inequalities. Thank you everyone for your questions and answers. And once again, I'd like to thank all of the um, speakers who've, who've shared their thoughts so far. I hope you know this session have given you the opportunity to reflect on important questions such as how can you decolonize your academic practices in doing research and how can you honor your local knowledge and languages while doing that. Um, we'll move to our last speaker for the day, um, the other co-chair, Dr. Bart Hall, to offer some concluding thoughts before we leave. Uh, Dr. Bart Hall is also a professor emeritus with the School of Public Administration at the University of Victoria, Canada, where I am. Go ahead, Bart. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Suryani. And uh, thanks to, to uh, Talwar as an organization. It's uh, very impressive. Uh, we were told before the we started that there are upwards of 800 uh, people from uh, all over the world who are participating in this conference. And uh, I can see by the faces uh, on my screen that in fact, uh, we are a, a truly uh, global, this is a truly global representation. Uh, I, it's, it's great to see uh, many, many faces, non-white faces, uh, you know, on the screen, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and it's, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, uh, Tom, and of course, Rajesh and Suryani for your very uh, good comments as you've been moderating. Uh, I think, so the question is um, about change. And uh, we've heard, we, we've heard a lot about um, you know, the potential role, uh, post-pandemic or not, what, what is the role of, the, uh, of universities or higher education uh, in, in our future? And really, we're now talking about our planetary future. We're in the context of post-pandemic, in the context of the climate crisis, in the context of the, you know, the global uh, inequalities and a kind of, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I would call kind of cowboy capitalism that is spread around the world with uh, so much uh, power and money in the hands of literally, you know, <laughs> a dozen individuals, you know. So uh, how, do, how do we change? So one thing it's important to remember is that universities are essentially, uh, you know, medieval institutions. They were created, you know, at, at, at a particular time, uh, you know, uh, in not only in Europe, but in uh, the, uh, you know, Arabic speaking world and uh, in the, uh, you know, in the Indian historic context. And, and these are institutions that have survived precisely uh, because they have, they incorporate a number of, of structures as medieval institutions. So they're very hard to change. They're very difficult to change um, because you've got uh, they're, they're, you've got disciplinary uh, a disciplinary structure. So um, you know we're all separated into uh, geographers or <clears throat> physicists or anthropologists or you know uh, you know chemical limnologists, uh, and our focus is on you know, on the, the discipline of our topic and what is important in our topic. So we, we don't, 
um, we don't share um, you know, a lot of interest in the in the the larger institution, the role of 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 our university, you know, in our community or in our society, and we're particularly these, these days we're more apt to have conversations with you know with a colleague in New Delhi or in uh, Jakarta, you know, or in London, you know, or in uh, in Tokyo than we are you know with a person in 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 our very building. So this is a this is a this create this creates uh, you know problems and we are we are hierarchical institutions um, you know the the professoriate are are you know there's different levels of you know of of teachers and researchers and uh, you have to be very careful to negotiate that careers are structured you know as Tom has said so much linked to you know kind of the rankings the metrics the publication so that it's it's pulling it it pulls us you know apart even though many of us would share the you know values of knowledge democracy so i i think one of the things to think to to keep in mind is that it is unlikely that higher education institutions will be able to change from within now that's not to say that that uh, th that inspired you know, uh, leadership is unimportant. It's terribly important, but the 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 the, uh, uh, the 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 global structure of universities is such that it's very difficult to break apart. So change, I think, is going to be come is going to come from uh, engagement with society, engagement with community, and that's why all of these uh, the discussions that we've had over the last 20 years about uh, community university engagement. That's why those are so important because it is, it is, it is from the, the amplification of uh, and giving more importance uh, to those, inst to, those uh, to, to, to outs those outside of the university that the power to change uh, is going to come. And I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, at my university, the University of Victoria, has a you know a an academic intellectual interest in you know indigenous perspectives. So they would like to add courses and content of an Aboriginal uh, nature to to the curriculum of the university. But I can tell you that that change would not have happened, and we're making good progress on that, but it would not have happened just depending on either the non-Indigenous or the Indigenous faculty, academic staff inside the university. In our case, it has come from pressure, continual pressure from the Indigenous communities, you know, surrounding, you know, uh, on the the, the traditional territory uh, that where we live and work. And it's been the engagement with knowledge keepers in the, you know, Kusanich community or the Songhees community, or which, which has pushed and continually pushed uh, the university to, uh, to change. And I would suggest that the same thing is true, um, you know, in other aspects. So um, change the, the the, the, the engagement with community is, is not just a service. It's not just the, the question of what can the university do for the communities. Our very capacity to change is dependent on, on this engagement. Um, second thing I would say is that, um, is that, you know, when Rajesh and I started doing this kind of work, you know, in the 1970s, you you wouldn't have a, a conversation about knowledge democracy or participatory research. You know, no universities were, you know, were interested in that. They was completely, you know, completely dismissed and marginal and, uh, you know, you is flaky, it's unscientific, it's unintellectual. Um, here we are, here we are with, I can see now 100 and uh, looks like 182 uh, people in a conversation, um, you know, about a, in a, a, a thoughtful, in, uh, you know, a su substantive conversation about knowledge, democracy, uh, and higher education. So the, the movement of which, you know, so many of us, you know, in this uh, listening to this panel and, you know, and, and certainly the people that were involved in the book, 
this is a movement which is which is sub substantial. Uh, it is growing. Um, and when you see um, organizations like the, the Directory of Open Access Journals, you know, the, the, the number, thousands and thousands of journals that are part, th this, there is a movement, this knowledge democracy, open access, open science, all of these are a movement. And this is, uh, this is hopeful. This is hopeful. And we have a choice, as Rajesh says, we have a choice. And you can even make a career. You can even make a career out of uh, you know raising these issues and and pushing your your university or pushing yourself starting from yourself. Um, so that's a um, another thing I would just like to to emphasize is the importance of of language. And as uh, you know, I think it was Tom in particular, you know, spoke about the kind of the monopoly. Um, you know, the way that the English language has dominated. Um, if we are, if we want to access the multiple epistemologies uh, in that, that exist in the planet, we have to, to invest in the revitalization and the promotion of local languages. And that includes uh, indigenous languages, land-based languages, ancient languages, but it also includes, you know, languages of, you know, smaller, you know, languages. I would even say like the Dutch language, which is, you know, the mother tongue of, uh, of not that many people, because it is in language that culture and knowledge exists. And if we, if the, the more we move towards, uh, towards, uh, towards English only, the, the harder it will be to access the, the breadth and the diversity of knowledges which the earth, uh, which the earth, which you know, which the creator, uh, you know, gave 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 to us. Um, the last thing I would say is uh, the it's very important, uh, you know, the in in terms of how do we deepen these kinds of conversations. It's very important organizations like Talwar to be able to have this kind of a conversation. But equally important, or perhaps more important, is each of you, each of you who are listening, there's no reason why you can't, uh, you know, uh, have a, a workshop or a seminar or give a talk, uh, you know, on these kinds of themes in your own universities. Um, I'll give, you know, one, one of the stories that I, that I recall when I was in Malaysia um, a couple of years ago was that the, um, the I was told that the Ministry of Higher Education was telling all of the, you know, in, uh, all of the academics in Malaysia, you need to now start publishing in English language journals, the ones that Tom was saying part of the, the big publishers, because that's the way we can build our rankings in Malaysia. Um, and and, and, and what the person told me uh, was that, um, you know, so many of our uh, good scholars have been writing, you know, in, in, in Bahasa, uh, you know, in, in Malay language. Um, and if we all now go over to, uh, to, to English, uh, where is the ongoing intellectual development, you know, which is contextualized, which is historically and culturally rooted so you can see that. So each of you, you know, who are listening today, please uh, find a way to raise these issues in, within your own, uh, um, you know, your own uh, unit, your own university, or find things to read for yourself to do that. Um, finally, or next to finally, um, the UNESCO is organizing its next large world conference on higher education in Barcelona in May of 2022. And I would uh, recommend all of you to, who are interested in, uh, you know, in these kinds of issues to take a look at, the, at the, the UNESCO website. It's called the World Higher Education Conference. And there will be ways to participate both virtually and, uh, and uh, in person in that, in that conference, and I would I hope that the kinds of issues that we're raising here today will have an influence on the agenda 
the agenda of the UNESCO conference is to create a paper on the future of higher education. And I would very, I would love to see uh, the kinds of perspectives that all of us share, you know, who are listening to this. So take a, take a look at that. The, uh, the, the last things to say is that following this session, there will be breakout sessions. There are four breakout sessions and you can find the links in the SCED. And, uh, and so thank you very much, everybody uh, for joining us and uh, all of the best. Hey everyone, just a small correction. I'm sorry, but I led you astray. <laughs> um, the other days of the conference will have four breakout sessions, but today actually is different. So there's just one plenary session at noon um, and it's gonna be the University Community Partnerships uh, Responses to COVID-19 Reflections on Innovative Civic Engagement. Um, so I've posted that link in the chat and you can also find it on SCED. Um, but thank you everyone so much for coming and thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Serena. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>